Hey, everybody, it's Mark. I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And as always, I've got an amazing guest on this week. I'm totally jacked up to talk to him. But before we get there, I want to remind everybody to go to my website, www.markpattersonnfl.com. And it is there that you can see many other podcasts of very inspirational people doing incredible things. I've done now over 175 of these things every single week. There's a new one coming out. And it's amazing that, um, I mean, I'm, yes, I'm doing cool stuff, but even people like me need to be inspired. And so it's always a lift when I hear these amazing stories that are out there. Also, while you're there, please go to iTunes. There's a little button that you can go hit for ratings and review. It helps with the popularity of the show, which just exposes more people to getting, a, again, that daily inspiration of getting out of bed and doing something amazing um, out there. Um, I continue to be involved with Higher Ground. We've come together to create the uh, Millia's Everest. My daughter has epilepsy, the Lotsi Challenge. So that's gonna be an incredible uh, adventure coming up back to Mount Everest to climb it to the top. Uh, back down to 26,000 feet, up to the top of the fourth highest mountain in the world, Lhotse, back down in hopes of, at the end of the day, raising $27,000, 940 to go towards, again, uh, higher ground, great organization full of uh, people, mainly military folks with uh, cognitive issues and amputation and things like that. So if any way that we can help people like my daughter with epilepsy and people with PTSD, get better. It's a great cause to be involved with. And of course, you can go find out more things about my Everest blog. I'll actually have a Garmin tracker that people can follow me going dot, dot, dot up the mountain and see my progress. Hopefully it's a clear dot to the top, clear dot back down to 26,000 feet, up uh, Lhotse and back down to the bottom, all safe and sound. Okay. So that's, again, www.markpattersonnfl.com. So let's get on to the guest today. I'm so jacked up to have this guy. He's a fellow mountaineer, but he does it slightly different than I do. His name is Mike Orlot. How are you doing, Mike? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, uh, I, I had a – it's not unusual that this happens this way, but I would say maybe 10% of the people that come to me – you know, they, 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 they are either referred or they, you know, they just reach out on their own and say, hey, I've got a book out or something, but you're in case you just saw some synergy, you reached out, I checked out your story and it's really cool. And what makes it really cool is like me, you're a mountaineer, you've been doing it for a long time. And somewhere in your past, your twin brother and yourself, Steve, decided to not just climb mountains, but actually go to the top of these things, mainly the hardcore stuff above um, 8,000 meters. And of course, that's above uh, 26,000 feet and actually ski down from the top. You know, I want to get into that with you, man. So, so you're in Aspen, I'm in some Valley. We're both in two amazing ski towns, one in Colorado, one in Idaho. And I want to, I want to go back to kind of like your base. Your dad sounded like he was an amazing guy. He was in the 1960 Olympics up in Tahoe. I was there for a Spartan race this last year. And there's still some quite a few remnants of the 1960 Olympics that happened up yeah. there. And, you know, where did your inspiration come from? I imagine your dad had some, somewhere in there, he helped towards the yeah. roadmap of that, uh, your, that journey. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, dad was, was just, uh, I was really fortunate in, in that I had a dad that was not only a really good dad, but he was also this world-class athlete. And, and just being in the Marolt household, you know, this was, I was born in 64. He was in the Olympics in 1960. So just having a dad that, that was that close to ski racing. Um, I was, I was exposed to a lot of, of his contemporaries and a lot of racers and, you know, to, to Steve and I, you know, they were just old guys that, that skied. We didn't really comprehend what those guys were, were really capable of doing. But as we grew older and as we got into skiing and, and dad never pushed us into anything, but as we got into skiing, we really started to have an appreciation for the disparity that exists between someone like my dad and, you know, literally the, all the rest of the people that, that click into skis. And, and so that was inspiring. And then at, at a really young age, at age 12, 
he saw that that my older brother was old enough to drive when I was 12. And after the lifts would close, we had these old Jeeps and we would drive to wherever there was snow and we'd start hiking up to just continue skiing. <clears throat> and he saw that and he one night just said, well, let's load up the car. And we didn't know what was going on. It was July 3rd. And uh, he said, we're going skiing. And, and there's a, about an hour drive east of Aspen, there's a, uh, the Independence Pass takes you over the Continental Divide. And, and you can drive up to the top of that pass, hike a little bit, and then ski a couple thousand feet back down to the road and then hitchhike back up. And uh, from the first day we did that, and it was on July 4th, and the, the, the bowl is actually called Fourth the July Bowl because a few people had kind of started that tradition. I mean, we were hooked. And you know, so he really pushed us. And then after we did that a few times, he started taking us to some other, other places up high. And, but he just, you know, being around him and, and being around all of his, his racing friends and, and ski friends, it was inspiring. And, and we knew that, that we wanted to, to, to ski. So um, very inspiring. And, and he helped us and he was never a, for example, I always tell people that he went to every baseball game I ever played, but when it came to ski races, he just had nothing to do with, with the ski races. He would train with us, but he just didn't want to put that pressure on us. And um, at the time, you know, it was frustrating a few times, but I understood, but he was always out training with us. And that's where he really pushed us and taught us how to, you know, link turns together. Yeah, lead by example. My dad was the same way. It was interesting and actually went the other way 100%. You know, it wasn't necessarily after uh, training with me, but he would throw the ball and that type of thing, but he never pushed. And I might score three touchdowns or something in high school and he'd say, hey, you blocked really well tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> if there was ever a way to really, you know, humble somebody and keep them grounded, uh, my dad did a great job of that. And again, a, a great mentor like your dad was yeah. uh, as well. So, you know, it's interesting because as, as you're telling your story and I'm just trying to imagine, you know, going back in the day, we're roughly the same age. And, you know, when you wanted to go up to and ski like a really cool bowl or something like that, you would just, you know, you get a chairlift ride up to a certain point. Then you take your skis off, throw them over your shoulder and you'd hike up to a certain point. And it was yeah. a bear. And what's happened is, as you know, over the course of time, as, the, as that particular sport, the way that we used to hike everything has evolved into this, this world called skinning, right? Touring. Yeah, that country, yeah right? AT touring. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. And I do that part of my training all the time, which is you strap on this sandpaper type material to the, to the bottom of your skis and you can literally ski up the mountain one by one. You don't slip back. When you get yeah. to the top, you rip them off. You strap your skis in, you can tighten them down in a certain way. You take those skins, you put them in a backpack and you go down and you have the greatest runs of all time. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's called earning your turns. And, um, you know, I'm still a hardcore on mountain skier. I mean, I ski three, four days a week. I can walk to the gondola is, you know, about a five minute walk from my office. And so in the afternoon, you know, before the lifts close, I'll call up Steve and we'll head over there and get a bunch of skiing. But what we gravitated towards was the the ski mountaineering and 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 the the phrase that they coined about that is earning your turns and um so you 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 can access a lot of that terrain from the the top of the mountains but you know we live in the elk range which is a 40 mile long range of uh peaks you know 12,000 to 14,000 feet and um he started by taking us and then as soon as we had driver's licenses uh, we fixed up uh, another old Willie's Jeep. So we each had a Jeep and I mean, we lived in the mountains, you know, we would, would, would throw all our gear in the back, never had tops on them, just throw the gear in the back, drive to the trailhead, start walking, start climbing, get to the top, see something else, ski down and just remember what we, we remembered what we saw. Well, you know, remember that shot over there. How could we get to that and, you know, get the topographical maps out at home and, it was just a, a a progression of sorts that started in the Alps and and eventually over our lifetime took us all around the world. So let, let's transition there. So that you know a lot of what I was attracted to, and I'm looking at this uh, incredible book. I'm I'm still trying to really to get my my first one out the door. I've written one, it was published, <laughs> but 
haven't done a whole lot, but you wrote this book called Natural Progression, A Lifetime of Skiing, The World's Greatest Ranges. So let's talk about how that progression went. So you're there with your dad and, you know, you're, I'm sure like here in Sun Valley, Idaho, part of the curriculum in, in grade school and high school is like two o'clock, they all go out on the slopes and they're skiing down the mountain and it's really outdoorsy. And so I'm sure you went through that progression. We talked about getting in the old Jeep and going up and trying to find the highest peak and hike up and yeah. sit down with your brother. Uh, so at what point did the light bulb go off for you? Were you like, I think there's a bigger picture. I want to take on some of the big boys around the world and get after it and ski those things down. And you actually became the first American, both you and your brother, to do this. Well, to ski from 8,000 meters, yeah. yeah. I, I think that when the light went off, we had climbed and skied all around Colorado since age 12. Then in, in college, we continued, you know, during summer breaks. Then we both worked for big CPA firms in, in the Bay Area. And, and one day I got a call from my buddy and he said, he went to school at UPS up in, in uh, at Puget Sound. Yeah. He said, you guys have got to come up and see Rainier. And so... We so didn't now, take, now, now you're talking about my old backyard. I'm from Seattle. Your backyard. Oh, yeah, yeah. UPS is outside of uh, Seattle, down by Tacoma. And Mount Rainier, of course, is the big 14,500-foot uh, peak that sits yeah. just outside of Seattle. Well, and it's it's an amazing place. And, and we were so sheltered because we had so many peaks to climb around here that we didn't think much of it. It was no higher than the peaks around here. And, and I'm telling you, when we got to the foot of that peak, we saw the Nisqually Glacier flowing off of that mountain. I mean, it was shies into hose. And I mean, we were, it was like, wow, that's a mountain. And we had great success on it because we, we've we got, you know, fairly natural ability to go high. And we've, we were always endurance athletes. And we got to the top of that and it became a, the start of a trend. Before we were even off Denali, Steve had the book Classic Climbs, 40, 50 Classic Climbs. He said, I don't care. I'm going to Denali. And so it took a couple of years to get to Denali. But um, before we were even off of, of Rainier, it was like, this is what I want to do. And and there was there were seeds. I mean, dad was really good friends with Jim Whitaker, who was the yeah. American to climb Everest. And and he he gave us the uh, gave dad the, the book, Americans on Everest, even before we could read you know, we were taking that thing to show and tell and, and looking at the pictures. And there was just something really attractive about putting on the gear and going to those places. And, and it, it didn't scare us. It, it got us excited. And, you know, uh, when we got to Rainier, that was more the real deal. I mean, that is a significantly different type of place than the Elk Range. I mean, there's no glaciers around here. There's no crevasses. And, and to get up there on the ice fields and to meander around the crevasses, being roped up the whole time, that was exciting. And, and for me, you know, one, one of those little moments, I just remember nobody was talking. And my crampons were crunching that hard snow. And it was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. That's when the light really went off. And that's, that was the catalyst to you know, a few more trips up to Rainier and ultimately Denali and several years up in the, in Alaska, which, which takes mountaineering even compared to Rainier to a just completely different level. I mean, you're looking at 12, 13,000 foot walls and glaciers that are just so long that they take days to get up and, and, and we had success there. And then we went into the Wrangell St. Elias range, which is just uh, down the coast from Denali and, and spent several years just messing around on the big peaks down there. And, you know, didn't have a lot of success because of the weather, but we learned how to survive and we learned how to climb. And, and then a guide from Denali who lived in Aspen said, what are you guys thinking? He said, I mean, everybody goes to Rainier, then everybody goes to Denali and nobody's going to South America. And all of our teachers climbed in the summer and they gave us a slideshow of Bolivia. So we went to Bolivia and we found out that we could perform uh, above 6,000 meters, 20,000 feet. And so since then, it's been a lot of training in Aspen, South America. Uh, we've, we've gone down there a couple dozen times in between the Himalaya. Eventually in 97, we finally got to Pakistan and made an attempt on Broad Peak. 
but the, the reason I, I titled the book Natural Progression is that it really has never been biting off more than we could chew. All of our parents, my friends and my dad just stressed being humble in the mountains and, and really, you know, you can go out there if you're prepared and you take the time to train, you can do that stuff safely. But if you run past your experience level, that's when bad shit happens. Yeah. And we just kept that in the back of our minds and slowly got to a place where our, our, our just mental confidence allowed us to look at something and say, yeah, I think I could do that. And, and so it was just a progression. Yeah, no, it, well, it's incredible stuff. And I think, you know, when I start talking about I'm going to Everest and I've had the various people come up to me and say, you got to be kidding me. You know, <laughs> I can't believe you're taking that on. I go, you know, it's exactly what you're talking about. You know, I didn't go from little league football to the NFL. You know, there's these yeah. different steps. There's the, the progression, as you call it, you know, from grade school to high school to college to the NFL. And over that period of time, there's a lot of years and a lot of getting your bell rung and what to do and what not to do in terms of being safe on the field and winning at whatever your sport is. Yeah. In, in your case, um, having grown up in the state of Washington, I climbed Rainier in 1998 successfully. Um, I've been up to Camp Mirror multiple times on just day hikes. I tried to yeah. go this last year. And, and it is, like you said, when you pull into the Paradise parking lot, it's intimidating. I mean, it's oh. right at the front door and you've got that big glacier staring right at you. <laughs> And it's just like, I understand now the dangers of what a mountain can present if you're not prepared for it. Well, and, but here's the difference, you know, comparing it to playing in the NFL. You had to pay your dues. You had to work up through the system. But the system is designed so that not everybody can make the NFL. Yeah. But it can go to any peak and try it. And, and so the, the, the name of the game in mountaineering is experience. And you really have to be cognizant of what those mountains are capable of throwing at you. And the only way to, to, to gain that awareness is by going to them and just really being humble, really taking it literally step by step and, and just not getting too excited about summits and all that stuff. And really just trying to figure out what they can throw at you because you can go to those mountains and get in over your head really quickly. Nothing will stop you except the natural environment. And unfortunately, when, when you get cut from, from a, a college team, you, you, you just walk away. When you get up and get over your, your head in the mountains, you can, you know, you can lose your life. Yeah. I had a, uh, a guy that I was, I've told the story a few times on the pod, but uh, he's a guy, Don Cash, that I had shared a tent with down in, uh, in Antarctica and uh, he was a guy that wonderful person, but did not put the time into it. It was really about the T-shirt and the saying, not about actually loving the process. And at the end of the day, he was one of those guys caught in line on Everest, not this last year, but the season before and got to the very top, fell over and, and that was it. And, and he's still up there and it's unfortunate. And we all had major concerns before we ever went up there. The, the guides had concerns. The guides down in Antarctica had concerns. He had lost multiple fingers and part of his nose on, on, yeah. uh, on uh, Denali uh, back in uh, 2018 when I was up there. So, you know, like you said, if you're not ready to take these things on, then you shouldn't be there in the first place. So I'm sitting here um, next to my desk and something you were, you very generously uh, sent me the other day, um, which I'm going to watch is called Skiing Everest. And so yeah. I want to talk about kind of, you know, we're talking about a natural progression and there's a bunch of mountains that you've done and I want to get into those as well. But how do you, how do you go from taking this on? I mean, this is, this is, there's a lot of stuff going on. And of course there's two sides of the mountain. Uh, there's the North side going through uh, China into Tibet. And there's also the, the South side, which is going through Nepal. So tell me yeah. like where this all came together and what the goal was going to be. I know ski from the top, but how are you going to do it? Well, the, the, you know, getting back to the progression, we'd literally be on one peak, see another peak and, and, and plan on going back to that peak the next year. And through that process, we gained a thousand meter peak experience on broad peak then we went back and got a whole bunch of 6,000 meter peak experience in South America. And so then by 2000, 
we no no buddy from North America or South America had ever skied from an 8,000 meter peak. And we didn't just automatically say, that's going to be us. We're going. The, the attitude was a little different. We, we had 8,000 meter peak experience. We knew we did well at altitude, but if you were to ask me, did you really honestly think you were going to ski that peak before you went? I, I, I mean, there's just no way. I mean, to that point, the only people, there were only a dozen people that had skied from 8,000 meters and they were just the all-stars of, of mountaineering. And, and, and yet we didn't let that dissuade us. We went with an attitude. We're going to take the skis. We're going to do some skiing. Yeah, I definitely want to get to the top, but I'm not going to push myself. I'm not so hell bent on on the goal to become the first American. That was not the driving force. The driving force was just to go and have a good trip, and and so we went and we had success. And it was a it was a you know everything went really well, but it was a really difficult trip because we experienced death for the first time uh, on that expedition. And it wasn't a, a guy in our party, but it was a Taiwanese climber next to us. And I mean, he got out of his tent and he was not doing well. And his Taiwanese team didn't have any medical drugs or anything. And we did. And so we offered to help. And I, I'll just never forget the guy was laying there. Steve had his hands on the pulse another doctor from another expedition came and administered, administered a bunch of drugs. And I just remember Steve saying, I got a pulse. Ugh, I don't have a pulse. I got a pulse. I don't have a pulse until the guy finally expired. And I mean, you know, in the book, when I say the guy literally died in our arms, he did. And, and that was whew, mentally to watch a human being go from being alive. And he was standing an hour before he died he was sick, but he was standing to see a guy go from standing to expiring in 60 minutes. I mean, my initial reaction was, I want to get the hell out of here. I mean, I just, I just, I can't handle this and because the thing, even if you do everything right, those mountains can get you. And, and you have to understand that when you decide that you're going to those peaks because it just makes you hypersensitive of the environment, of your body, of how everything's working. And a lot of times people just get too blinded by the summits, but we persevere, persevered, we pushed through that. We ended up getting to the top. And as we took each step, we literally gained momentum and confidence. And I remember we were at about, uh, it was on our summit day, nobody else on the peak and a uh, huge storm had blown in and Jimmy had already dropped his skis at 7,000 meters, which was another mental hurdle. It's like, oh my God, my buddy is dropping his skis. And, you know, Steve took me by the collar and said, we can do this. You know, it's 3,000 feet. It's Aspen Mountain. I'm, we're doing it. So then we got up to about 7,500 meters. And I said, do you think we should drop the skis? I mean, the summit was right there. And Steve just smirked at me like, you have got to be kidding. I have no interest in climbing up this peak without skis. And we got to the top of the central peak and, and we skied it. And that was a huge, huge accomplishment. And before we were out of base camp at Shishapangma, we knew we were going to Everest. We had no clue how we were going to raise the money. We didn't know how much it was going to cost. But before we were off that peak, we knew we were going to Everest. So it was about a 12-year process of Elk Mountains, Alaska, South America, Pakistan, Tibet, to where we finally realized that, you know what, I don't know if I can carry skis without oxygen, without Sherpa and without drugs, because we climb totally pure style. I don't know if I can do it, but it was the same attitude on Shish. I'm going to try and I'm going to, I'm going to just take it a step at a time and see how I'm doing. So let's get into Everest again. Like, give me like what size you went and then the route up, give me, give, give me a sense of how far you got up on Everest, that maybe it was to the top, maybe it wasn't. But l tell me about that experience. Well, the first, we, we tried it twice. We tried it in 2003, and we had a big team, all friends, and, uh, you know, totally unsupported. And, and we went and a really massively tough expedition. We got up to the, the route starts at base camp at 17,000. Then you got to walk. And what side are you on? What? 
What side north are you on? Side, I'm sorry, north side, Tibet side. All right. So we've got a, a long 12 to 14 mile trek just to get up to advanced base camp, all above 17,000 feet. And we got up there and we got our camp established at the North Col, which is uh, about 7,000 meters. And then we had a 30 day windstorm and nobody was climbing the peak. And the, the disadvantage that we had was that we we weren't using oxygen and and being at 23,000 feet for 30 days we just deteriorated so we went up and we actually made a summit bid it was still horrible weather and we we managed to ski from about 25,500 feet and uh so that was a huge huge goal I mean you ski from above 23,000 feet anywhere in the world that's a huge deal and we were the first Americans to ski that north ridge which is a you know, it's like a barn roof. It's it's not very wide and it just falls straight down on both sides. So it was a precarious situation and it was super hard snow. It was ice and snow and the wind was so strong from the windstorm that it was uh, peppered with little small pieces of rock. And um, so we managed to ski it, but we didn't get to the top. And uh, before we were off, we knew that we wanted to come back. So we, we uh, that was 2003. Then we made our second attempt in 2007. And uh, we learned a lot on that first trip. We learned that it's really tough to, to climb the north side of Everest without oxygen because when you're climbing those big peaks, the general protocol is that you climb high and you sleep low. So you go and you get the mountain set up from advanced base camp, and then you go back down to base camp, which is 17,000 feet, which is still high, but you can really rest well. And especially when you're acclimated to seven or 8,000 meters. And, and the problem was, is that you'd walk that 14 miles back down to base camp, rest up, feel great, turn around. And after you hiked that 14 miles, you were already tired when you got back up to advanced base camp and we didn't have oxygen on the mountain. And, and so we, we just, we got really, really, really tired. So for the second trip, uh, we decided that we'd go to another 8,000 meter peak called Choyo Yu, which is also in Tibet. And it was a much easier mountain to acclimate on because you didn't have those long carries. And um, we went there, had success, skied from the summit. So Steve and I got our second 8,000 meter peak ski, which was, uh, you know, not that we're into statistics at all, but after the fact, we found out only five people had multiple 8,000 meter peak ski descents and gave us a lot of confidence. And so we got off of that peak, rested a week. Then we went back to Everest and uh, we all felt great, got up to uh, the Northeast Ridge. So we were at just over 28,000 feet, but we started out a little bit too early in the morning and it was super, super cold and we're still in ski boots and our feet started to freeze. And you know, I just didn't want to lose my toes. And, and so we turned around and, and Everest was, was it, it, it's still a big dream. I still want to go and do it. I, I, I don't know if at age 55, I can go up there and, and ski off the summit of that peak, but, but I've got two ski descents from above, uh, 25,000 feet. And, uh, but it definitely kind of sent us on a, a, a different path after that, just because Everest has, changed just since we first climbed it to now. I mean, the, the crowd situation is, 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 uh, there's just a lot of people on them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm for sure hoping next year when I go, uh, in 2021, that a lot of those crowds died down just a little bit due to COVID or whatever, but it is what it is. You know, I'm going, I'm it is what it is. But yeah. I'm going forward on it. Okay. So, so you do that. Yeah. You come down now, my, when I'm thinking about when you're skiing down, um, any kind of mountain, you're not tethered in. So one of the things that, at least when you're climbing, um, you you have a, um, you know, you're clipped in, right, to a fixed, fixed line. And yeah. with, I mean, it sounds to me like you're just like, you know, it's you and you only. And if you fall, man, you got big problems. Well, just to kind of go back, to, especially the first time that we skied Everest, we're at, you know, over 25,000 feet. And that whole ridge is fixed. So we're climbing it on the fixed line and it was super, super icy. And, and we got up to where we, we put the skis on and it was just my brother, Steve, and my cousin, Jeremy Oates. And the snow is just, 
you know, thank God that the North Ridge kind of has steep pitches that roll off a little bit into steep pitches. So you've got these safety zones where if you do start sliding, you just have to get to one of those cups where the snow kind of slides off and it's soft to where your edges will grip. And, and hopefully that's enough. And when we got up there, unclipping from that fixed line is, it was a really big mental hurdle. Yeah. Bigger mental hurdle was standing at 25,000 feet with no crampons. Cause you got to take your crampons off to ski yeah. and, and no security from the edges. I mean, you just, I felt like I was naked at a cocktail party. I mean, it was yeah. just horrendously uncomfortable. So we quickly got into our skis and, and then I'm a skier and I'm comfortable on skis. You know, that my edges, I feel actually more comfortable on skis than I do crampons. And I skied up to the fixed line and we kind of discussed it. The wind is howling. And uh, should we clip into the fixed line and ski it, you know, on belay or, and, and I'm just totally focused. And all of a sudden, I just knew I could do it. And I pushed off and my brother and Jeremy are going, what are you doing? Wait, wait, be careful. And I made the first few turns. And from that point, uh, it gave those guys a lot of confidence. And we ended up skiing it. Um, you compare that to the second time we skied that ridge, it was moderately soft snow. But yeah, I mean, you're, 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 you're totally exposed and you are relying 100% on the automation that you have standing on skis after doing it hundreds of days a year for the last, you know, 20 years. And um, so skiing is a unique aspect of mountaineering that, that a lot of people can ski, but not a lot of people are super comfortable skiing on those high peaks just because the snow is not groomed and it's, it, 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 it's pretty rough. And, and, and so it, it, it's exciting, but that's why we do it. Well, through and through, again, I'm, I'm sitting here with this DVD in my hand, uh, Beyond Skiing Everest and Skiing Everest. Like, so tell me the process of, of number one, you're going to go up and, and, and ski Everest and come down and ski these other peaks. But as it relates to this particular one, that now you're going to also bring a film crew. I've been on all these peaks, six of the seven around the world. And, you know, there, it's just a lot of, of course management of just trying to get yourself up and down and stay warm, yeah. stay hydrated and food and everything else, so let alone try to film yourself, which I, you know, I did on my first one on, in, on Tanzania and uh, Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And it was such a pain in the ass. I like, what the hell? So tell me how you pulled that off to create this movie. Well, I, I mean, the first, the, my first experience with the film stuff was on Shishapangma and Part of the reason that we were able to go on that trip is that we had been approached by a film company that asked if they could send a film crew and, and we needed the money and, and they wanted the film. And so we said, yeah. And what we learned from that experience was when you've got people you don't know climbing with you and around you and having to help carry a lot of their gear and stuff like that, it just was that that was never going to happen again. But what happened on that trip is I really gained a, another passion to try and get the shot. And, and to that point, the only people, the only shots of skiers were in the movie, the man who skied down Everest and they were from a tripod with a super telephoto lens. And there was no ski footage of anybody from the source, you know, being right there with a handheld camera. And I thought, you know what, it adds an extra 10 or 15 pounds to my pack, but I just, I fell in love with getting the shot. And so after that trip, I, I looked for the best camera gear and I, I was pretty much the crew and I would, you know, get small cameras and hand them to Steve and Jim and just say, just shoot, just point and shoot and just get video footage. And it, it was still a pain in the ass for them because I would ski down and I'd say, okay, I got to get this shot. And, you know, the, the whole way that we financed all of our expeditions was through the movies. And so we had to be responsible to the people who were writing the checks and I would get the shots and, you know, it would, it would take a normal day that would take, you know, six or seven hours and it would add an extra hour or two for the setup and the shot. And, you know, when you're in those peaks, you can't say you got to hike back up and I got to get it again. So 
Um, but I, I, I got used to carrying the gear and, and I, 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 if you told me to go out and shoot golf, I couldn't, I can't even shoot family videos, but I just practiced with the camera shooting it at climbers and shooting it at, at people skiing that I got, you know, fairly decent. I'd never call myself a professional photographer, but I'd come back with a, a dozen hours of, of footage and, and then I'd sit down and we'd just start throwing it together. But it, it, it was really two passions. I mean, I, I love getting the shots. I love putting the, the films together. I love finding people that were better than me that could help me really edit it and stuff. And at the end of the day, we, we, came out of it with skiing Everest and then a sequel uh, beyond skiing Everest. So how do you see your path forward? Now you mentioned you're 55, you've done a lot of these things going around the world several times, done some movies, been on Everest, all these other big mountains um, around the world. What is like the path forward for you to stay with your purpose, your why, why you get out of bed? Well, I mean, Mark, I think that, um, you know, we've done close to 60 of those expeditions to the 5,000 to 8,000 meter peaks. And if you'd asked me 15 years ago, if I'd still be doing this stuff, I would have just, I would have laughed. And, and, and we got really, really lucky because when we started this stuff, we were in the first generation AT ski gear. And I mean, it was horrible. It was heavy. It didn't perform. And so that forced us to train even harder so that we could accommodate that. Well, as we started to get older, the, the gear started to get a lot better. Yeah. And, and so what I'm finding now at age 55 is that I've got this track record of experience and I'm not as strong as I was, but over on the other side of the equation, the gear is so light and performs so well that it's, it's almost exceeded our ability to age. And so, it's still fun. And, um, you know, we got caught in, in the COVID we were supposed to be on a training climb in, uh, Peru last May and that got canceled. And that was a training climb for our, our ultimate passion right now, which is climbing and skiing in the Himalaya in the winter, which is a pioneering effort because nobody's ever climbed and skied the, the, the high peaks. I mean, there, there's a fair bit of skiing below 6,000 meters, but there's no skiing without the exception of us above 6,000 meters. And, um, it, it, the, the reason why that is so, uh, engaging is that you really have to, in order to go and be successful and safe in the Himalaya in the winter, you, you almost have to have a lifetime of experience in the normal season. And it, it, it's, it's, a it's just a completely different activity. So it's like, we're 55 we started the winter stuff several years ago, but we're beginners at it. And it's fun to be doing something at, at that level where it's so completely new and so completely different that it, it, it just makes Steve, Jim, and I, we just want to keep going back and doing it. So hopefully we'll get to Peru and, and repeat that training uh, in May. And, and we've got the funds and everything ready to go for an attempt at a 7,000 meter peak near Dalagari for not this January, but in a year and we're still fit. And, you know, the only benefit of COVID is that I'm probably as fit as I've been in, in, you know, four or five years, just because I'm going crazy. And the, the way that I medicate my craziness is by running up a mountain. Yeah. Well, we are two birds of a feather. <laughs> Cause I've been doing the same thing. You know, I thought I was in shape last year. I'm in super shape um, this year. So, you know, the thing I love about that is that, uh, you have pivoted, made a pivot uh, several times in your career, what you're trying to do. And I think that just trickles down to everybody who might be listening to this pod, like, you know, put your goals out there and either run them out or they're not what you thought. So, you know, you got to take a right hand turn and come up with something else. And, yeah. you know, and like you said, you almost feel like a beginner in the Himalaya for the winter assault. Yeah. A sense. And, and, you know, what a great thing to kind of get you out of bed again and get that spring in your step. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a two years older than you, and I feel like, like the game is only beginning, right? And, and, and when you look at it from all the things that I have not done, not what I've done, and, you know, it's a big world out there, and there's a lot of fun things to go after and chase down. Well, I, I mean, you, you look at, at Mira, the guy who skied Everest back in the 70s, and 
he climbed Everest when he was 80 years old. And, and I look at, at some of the guys that I really, you know, I, I, I didn't know him until later, but the Hans Kammerlanders and the Peter Oblers and, and, and these guys are all, you know, 15 to 20 years older than me. And, and they're still out there doing it. And I think the key is that, you know, I've always been a trainaholic from, the, you know, high school until now. I've always really enjoyed training and I've always enjoyed experimenting with training, you know, post 40, post 45 it, it, the game really changes and, and it, it sometimes is really hard, but you have to rest a little bit more than, than you used to. And, and you, you gotta be careful about not getting carried away, but the technology, not just in the ski equipment, but in the nutrition and in the, the way that people work out. I mean, I'm, I'm part of this Facebook group called training for alpinism and, and the uphill athlete. And, and I've learned so much in the two years that I've been uh, associated with that, just from being a fan, that it, it, it's crazy. And, you know, Jim was quoted in an article one time saying, you know, we'll climb and ski until it's no fun. And it's still fun. So we're still doing it. Love that. Love that. Okay. Listen, where can people find you? Uh, they can get the links to the book and both the films can be found at skiingeverest.net. And the, the film is available on Apple, Amazon, Google Play, Vudu. The book is available also at um, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and, and, and Apple. And, but the, the focal point, to, you know, is, is it, it, the, the, the catch-all. You're guaranteed to get the links and everything you need to know at skiingeverest.net. No, I love it, man. You're getting after it. You've gotten after it. You put some big ass goals out there and, you know, some you've succeeded at and some you haven't, but the bottom line, the common denominator here is just that you keep trying and keep getting after it and getting out of bed and, you know, having that motivation piece to, to not be stuck and to contribute to the world. I love that. Well, and I mean, you know, Messner hit it on the head. I mean, you know, someone asked him, well, what's your definition of adventure? And, and he, he nailed it. I mean, adventure is taking on projects until you succeed. You, you take them on, uh, not until you succeed, you take them on as many times as it takes to understand that you cannot accomplish it or you accomplish it. But you, you can't give up on anything until you just give it 110% because there's nothing worse than unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been the story of our career. I mean, I can't tell you how many peaks we have had multiple times where we have to fly to Asia or we have to fly to South America just over and over. I mean, Ilimani took us four attempts um, to ski it and uh, a couple others, you know, two or three times. But, but what I tell people and what I like to tell young people is set your goal, put it out here, but don't fixate on it. And it's like I said in the book to you. What I've learned at 55 after going on almost 60 of these things is that when you get to a base camp, you don't look at the summit, you don't think of the summit until you can bend over and touch it. And, and the reason why that's so important is because when you fixate on something in the future that may or may not happen, you waste a tremendous amount of energy. But more importantly, you waste uh, uh, an opportunity to have a really great experience. And, and at the end of a career, at the end of a day, at the end of a career, uh, or the, even the end of an expedition, if you can just put that goal aside and enjoy where you are, the here and now, that equates to a string of really great experiences as opposed to worrying about not getting the summit or you know worrying about failure. And, and, and in my experience, when I just really try to enjoy even the misery of a situation in those mountains, you almost always end up attaining your goal. But if you don't, you still had a great experience because it was fun. Well, you tried number one. And what you're really saying is be present and live in the moment. And that's where it, all the joy and happiness come from. So exactly. listen, I totally appreciate you coming on the pod. You're awesome. I love what you're doing out in the world. There's obviously some crossover with what I'm up to. And uh, hope to continue to be connected with you and, and get out to Aspen and climb as soon as I can. 
Well, and good luck to you. I mean, you're on the you're on the a very similar path, and you know what I'm talking about. And yeah. And uh, I'll be following you and, and very excited for what you're doing and, and, you know, give it hell. There is. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Right on. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.